All right, Dr. Han, thank you for joining us here today to talk about Rotorax. I just have a couple questions that I want to ask you. Uh, so just to start out in your practice, what is your signal to use Rotorax? Is it something you are always going to do or is there something that you're specifically seeing in the angiogram? There's two different indications that I use Rotorax for. Uh, I use it as a primary atherectomy device when I cross the lesion and I feel fairly confident that I cross through the true lumen, then it is my go-to atherectomy device. Uh, the the board tip of the atherectomy, uh, the board tip of the rotorax actually does a very good job in gaining me a pretty decent sized lumen. The second indication is for mixed morphology lesions. Oftentimes we'll have these acute on chronic kind of patients who have some underlying chronic disease as well as acute thrombus within that vessel. Uh, I think Rotorex is my go-to device in those situations. It does a good job of thrombectomizing the acute uh, uh, clot that's sitting within that vessel as well as atherectomizing uh, the chronic disease that's within that vessel as well. We talked about that dual indication of atherectomy and thrombectomy and a little bit of the method of action um, and its ability to treat mixed morphology. So when you're crossing a lesion, is there an indication that you can tell it has that mixed morphology or what is a factor that helps you determine that you feel like Rotorex would be good in that lesion? It's a good question. My own personal experience, I found that Rotorex is the one that is actually as true to that indication as possible where I can ac accomplish both the thrombectomy and the atherectomy in one device. Um, oftentimes it starts with the patient's history, some sort of chronic uh, peripheral vascular disease history along with a acute change will indicate to me that potentially this person has had an acute occlusion of this uh, blood vessel as well. And then oftentimes when you're crossing the lesion and your wire flies through what looks like a long segment CTO, even though it makes you feel good that maybe you're very skillful, oftentimes it it just means that that portion of the artery is full of acute clot. That's why the wire uh, behaves so easily. So I think there is certainly some element of the way that the wire crosses uh, that will add a lot of information. In addition, intravascular ultrasound has entered many of our practices, including my own, and it gives you a, an ability to evaluate the actual lesion itself. Um, and you can see and tell the difference between a chronic calcified kind of thrombus versus an acute clot that's sitting with, within the vessel. Are you using IVIS every time prior to using Rotorex or? As much as possible. IVIS has become a lot more ubiquitous in my practice than it had before. That's great. Um, okay, so I want to ask you a little bit, do you use Rotorex and ISR? And if so, uh, what has been your experience of Rotorex working in an uh, instant? It's been good. I've, I do use it in ISR. Uh, it actually has become my go-to device for ISR. And depending on the size of the set that's already in, uh, oftentimes I will grab a, a French Rotorex device. Um, it's actually really ideal for, for it because it, it's giving you a um, good channel for it to actually. So Rotorex works really well in ISR because it gives you a channel. Um, Oftentimes you'll have segments of significant ISR and then thrombus beyond it. So it does a good job in clearing the thrombus as well as giving you some luminal gain within that stent, which oftentimes we know in ISR, that's the biggest challenge. Regaining luminal flow uh, just with angioplasty alone seems limited, mainly because you're not clearing any of the disease within that stent. So I like uh, Rotorex for that indication. There are times that it doesn't work very perfectly well, especially if the wire, for example, you cross in chronic ISR and somehow your wire is leaning heavily against one side of the wall or not, then um, the, the spinning burr can actually come into contact with the actual uh, stent. So in that kind of scenario, it might not be the most favorable. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. So um, just a little bit on your technique when using uh, Rotorex. So are you ever using a filter with it or how many passes do you typically to take with the device? Do you tend to use uh, either the eight French or the six French over the other? Or does that kind of go back to your comments about ISR and sizing the vessel? Yeah, so I'll start with the last question first. If I'm primarily using the device as a thrombectomy device, I try to use an eight French catheter. Um, this is for a occluded PTFE bypass, uh, long segment ISR, or something like this. If I'm 
trying to use it for thrombectomy purposes. I try to use an eight French catheter when we can, but the six French catheter really is the workhorse that I use more often in my practice for all comers. Um, in terms of technique, uh, the Rotorex does need a decent amount of support on an 018 platform. My experience is with a spider filter, and I found that over a spider filter, it really just doesn't give too much support for the Rotorex to pass through. So I've converted just to using the Rotorex 018 wire, and the results have been a lot more successful. Haven't had too much issues with embolization. I actually use the distal cap as uh, a um, embolic protection to some level, and before I clear across the distal extensive lesion, I will be pretty thorough in going back and forth. It's not necessarily a pass. It's not like other atherectomy devices where you're doing a pass from the top to the bottom of the lesion, but it's actually a lot of going back and forth. You have to think of it almost like a thrombectomy device. In terms of technique, um, it's not really passes. Uh, you, like you think about with other atherectomy devices where you think you do one or three passes and you're done. Um, I think it's two separate things. You really do want to use it like a thrombectomy device where you're starting from the top of the lesion and verifying that you have flow uh, as you're moving down that lesion. Remember, Rotorex works best uh, in a setting where you have flow coming into the catheter. Otherwise, the, the heating element, otherwise the rotating element will heat up and potentially can become this large. So you're starting from the top of the lesion, moving slowly back and forth and back and forth and establishing flow throughout the segment of that uh, lesion before you cross the distal lesion. The distal lesion will act as a embolic protection to some level until you've kind of crossed that lesion and gained yourself the lumen. Yeah, I agree with all your comments. So lastly, just any advice that you would give to a new user before using Rotor X? Um, so Biggest thing for me was using the 018 wire that came with the actual kit. Oftentimes, if you do, if you are uh, someone who uses a filter wire often, it might be a little bit of a change from your actual practice. But uh, I, I think the Rotorex works uh, over a stiffer 018 wire that gives you more more support. In addition, be patient. This isn't. This is a. You know, there's a lot of tactile, tactile feel that you can get, as well as you can see the blood that's entering the uh, collection bag. So you want to start from the top and move very slowly throughout the segment. And it's not, don't think of it in terms of passes, just think of it as establishing from flow from the top of the lesion all the way to the bottom. I think you'll have very good success. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that tactile feel? Yeah, so when you're, you will hear audible changes on the pitch of the Rotorex if it's engaging any kind of lesion. So obviously, whenever you encounter that kind of area, let the Rotorex spinning burr work. Uh, you can leave it sitting on that lesion, move back, and then re-engage the lesion until that uh, sound is gone. And that will give you some idea that that uh, lesion has been successfully atherectomized. In addition, you're keeping an eye on the collection bag throughout the entire time that you're using the device. It will give you a strong idea whether or not you're in an area of flow or whether or not you're in an area of occlusion. You mentioned moving the device back. Um, are you leaving the device activated when you're doing so, or do you take your hand off the like trigger or foot pedal? I like to, even with the move back, I, you know, I often think that if you're, if you're thinking of it as a thrombectomy device, it gives you the option to, um, I guess, suction out any other debris or clot that's still sitting in that area. So when I'm moving the device back, I still have the device on oftentimes.